Welcome to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. My name is Elizabeth Edelstein, and I'm the Vice President for Education here at the museum. We're so glad you could join us for the third annual memorial lecture for Dr. Yaffa Eliach. We're honored to present this program to commemorate Kristallnacht. As many of you know, Dr. Eliach is very important to this museum, this institution's history. In 1990, her groundbreaking Center for Holocaust Studies, Documentation, and Research merged with this museum. This was seven years before this museum opened its doors. And the merger shaped what would become our work, our approach, and our mission. The Center for Holocaust Studies testimonies are at the heart of how we present Holocaust history. Today you will hear from members of Dr. Eliak's family who will illuminate her contributions from their perspective. We will then hear from a distinguished scholar, Dr. Deborah Dwork, who will present a talk on the world of Auschwitz. On behalf of the museum's president and CEO, Jack Klieger, our chairman, Bruce Ratner, and the board of trustees, I extend our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Eliak's family for their willingness to participate in this program and for sharing it with a public audience. At this time, I welcome to the stage members of Dr. Elias' family. Good afternoon. My name is Smada Rosenzweig. I'm a professor of Bible at Stern College and daughter of Rabbi David Eliach, maybe he blessed with continued amazing health and long life, and Dr. Yaffa Eliach of Blessed Memory. Thank you, Liz Edelstein, for your opening remarks, and I want to thank Samantha Shokin for your assistance in planning this program. I would also like to thank the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, for hosting this third annual memorial lecture to honor my mother's seminal contribution to Holocaust research and commemoration. Thank you, President Michael Glickman, for your leadership to advance Jewish memory and history through the exhibits and educational programs that the museum offers. The earliest original interviews and artifacts from the Center for Holocaust Studies, documentation and research that my mother established are housed here. They form the original core of the museum's archival resources relating to the Holocaust. My mother was a trailblazer and pioneer in researching and commemorating the Holocaust. Her work is well represented here in the Museum of Jewish Heritage and also in the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. and in Yad Vashem, Jerusalem. This past Wednesday, Chet Cheshvan, the eighth day of the Jewish month of Cheshvan, was my mother's third York site, the third anniversary of her passing. And at a time like this, it is appropriate to ask, why do we commemorate the deceased? Why commemorate important events in history? Why commemorate the Holocaust? My mother opens her book, Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust, with this piece. When Pharaoh restored the chief butler to his position, as foretold by Joseph in his interpretation of the butler's dream, he forgot Joseph. The butler did not remember Joseph and forgot him. Why does the Bible use this repetitive language? It's obvious that if the butler forgot Joseph, he did not remember him. Yet both verbs are used, remembering and forgetting. The Bible, in using this language, is teaching us a very important lesson, said the Holocaust survivor, the Hasidic rabbi of Bluzhov, Rabbi Israel Spira of blessed memory, whom my mother interviewed and is memorialized throughout my mother's book, Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. There are events of such overbearing magnitude that one ought not to remember them all the time, but one must not forget them either. Such an event is the Holocaust. My father, Rabbi David Eliach, has a similar approach. The book of Deuteronomy states, Zachor et asher asalcha Amalek lo tishkach. Remember what Amalek did to you, never forget. Why does it tell us to remember and not forget? If you remember, you are not forgetting. My father suggests that some events in the human Jewish experience are so horrific and profound that once a year they must be remembered consciously and actively. And this is represented by the word zachor, remember, a vigorous dem demonstration of remembrance. Additionally, 
We cannot forget it. Al tishkach. Every day, this concept must be somewhere in our subconscious and animate our actions. We are commanded to remember the exodus from Egypt every day, yet we set aside a special evening, the Passover Seder, to immerse ourselves in the retelling of the exodus story. We experience it and we live it and incorporate its lessons into our lives. Why do we need a separate exalted evening of discussing the exodus story if we mention the exodus every day in our prayers? This intense retelling, zahor, immersion, reenactment, as my husband, Rabbi Michael Rosenzweig, elucidates, enables us to remember our exodus from Egypt every day. This intense active remembrance defines our connection to the exodus story and its place in our lives. Without this one night of intense engagement with the exodus, we cannot properly remember the exodus the rest of the year. Today, we are commemorating and remembering a woman who worked tirelessly to implore the world to actively remember, commemorate, and respect those who perished in and survived the Holocaust. She implored the world to know their stories, their lives, to understand the, wor to understand the world that was destroyed, and most importantly, to learn lessons from that event for the future. Remember, never forget, and educate the world so it will never happen again. My mother's work documented both the life and death of European Jewry. My mother's book, There Once Was a World, is a 900-year history of the shtetl of Eishishok, and her tower faces in the United States Holocaust Museum are her monument and memorial to her town, Eishishok. Her interviews of Holocaust survivors and her book, Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust, revolutionized the value of the personal stories and their importance in understanding world events. She was the first to emphasize the religious experience in the Holocaust and to highlight the importance of spiritual resistance, the central role that women played before and during, during the Holocaust and moral resistance. My mother was a woman of substance who spent her life in the service to the Jewish community and university community. She was a world-class scholar who played a leadership and pioneering role in almost every area where she ventured. She was an inspirational master teacher, scholar, speaker, and writer. She was creative and visionary, and many times had to fight for her ideas to be accepted. She was a role model to many women scholars and professionals. My mother was also a very devoted wife, mother, and grandmother. She put her family first. Our home was a place filled with vibrancy and color. My mother had flair. She shared with us her stories from her past in an uplifting and positive way while keeping the gravity of the message intact. My mother was optimistic despite the terrible tragedies that she lived through during the Holocaust. She discussed her scholarship and new ideas with us. She loved to host festive events and holidays and wanted to recreate the warm, inviting atmosphere she remembered as a child in the shtetl before its destruction. Our home was filled with Torah and culture, and my mother and father encouraged us to work towards tikkun olam, making the world a better place. My mother doted on her grandchildren, many are here today, and remember her and my father taking them on trips to the Poconos, treating them to special experiences, lavishing them with presents and special outfits for the holidays, and the older ones I'm sure remember the smell and taste of her special safta cookies and the sound of her mellifluous voice. I want to end with a short Hasidic tale from her book, Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust, so we can hear some of her voice through her writings. I'm going to read the very short tale, Good Morning, Herr Müller, one of the most classic books from her book, Hasidic Tales. Near the city of Danzig lived a well-to-do Hasidic rabbi, a sign of prominent Hasidic dynasties. Dressed in a tailored black suit, wearing a top hat, carrying a silver walking cane, the rabbi would take his daily morning stroll, accompanied by his tall, handsome son-in-law. During his morning walk, it was the rabbi's custom to greet every man and woman and child who he would meet on his way with a warm and cordial good morning. Over the years, the rabbi became acquainted with many of his fellow townspeople this way and would greet them with their proper title and name. Near the outskirts of town in the fields, he would exchange greetings with Herr Müller, a Polish Volksdeutsche, ethnic German. Good morning, Herr Müller, the rabbi would hasten to greet the man who worked in the fields. Good morning, Herr Abiner, would come to response with a good-natured smile. Then the war began. The rabbi strolled, stopped abruptly. Herr Müller docked an SS uniform and disappeared from the fields. 
The fate of the rabbi was that of like much of the rest of Polish Jewry. He lost his family in the death camp of Treblinka and after great suffering was deported to Auschwitz. One day during the selection at Auschwitz, the rabbi stood on line with hundreds of other Jews awaiting the moment when their fates would be decided for life or for death. Dressed in a striped camp uniform, head and beard shaven and eyes feverish from starvation and disease, the rabbi looked like a walking skeleton. Right, left, left, left. The voice in the distance grew nearer. Suddenly, the rabbi had a great urge to see the face of the man with the snow white gloves, the small baton, and steely voice who played God and decided who should live and who should die. He lifted his eyes and heard his own voice speaking. Good morning, Herr Muller. Good morning, Herr Rabina, responded a human voice beneath the SS camp, a cap adorned with skull and bones. What are you doing here? A faint smile appeared on the rabbi's lips. The baton moved to the right, to life. The following day, the rabbi was transferred to a safer camp. The rabbi, now in his 80s, told me in his gentle voice, this is the power of a good morning greeting. A man must always greet his fellow man. What my mother did with these tales, as she wrote in her introduction, and I am paraphrasing, was to enable people to transcend the historical reality of their surroundings, to endow the pain and suffering with personal hope, and remain optimistic, even in the valley of death. Evil is transient, and good always must prevail. Faith becomes an optimistic link, providing continuity between past and future, while endowing the wretchedness, wretchedness and horror of the present with dignity. These oral histories and tales assume the dimension of moral and social reflections and commentary. At a time when human beings were stripped naked of everything, even their names, the only resource remaining to them was their inner spiritual strength and dignity. This was their very essence of existence. By restoring the vanished past and by capturing those sparks from the darkness of the Holocaust, my mother immortalized Jewish memory and Jewish spirit. And in so doing, she secured her immortal place within Jewish history. Her gift to us, her family, her students, and the world at large was her ability to capture the spark of what was destroyed. She signed every book that she dedicated with the phrase, Me'at or doche harbe choshech, a glimmer of light chases away all the darkness. It is our duty to pass on the flaming torch from one generation to the next. May her legacy shine forever. I want to introduce my brother, Rabbi Yotav Eliach, principal of Ramba Masifta High School in Lawrence, New York, and the author of the recently published insightful book, Judaism, Zionism, and the Land of Israel. Besides thanking the museum, I want to thank every person here who made it their business to come here today. Thank you. I'm going to start by reading a Perak Tehillim. I'm sorry I do not have the English translation. Mizmone David, Adonai miyagor ba'alecha, mishkon bahar kochecha, olech tamim upa'al tzedek, v'dover emet bilvavo, l'ragal aleshono, לא עשה לרעי הוראה, וחרפה הוא לא נשא על קרובו. נבזה בעיניו נמאס, ואת יראי אדוני יכבד. נשבע להרע ולא ימיר. כספו לא נתן בנשך, ושוחד הנקי לא לקח. עושו אלה לא ימות לעולם. Before I speak about what I think of my mother's two greatest contributions, I just want to add that my mother was an exceptionally proud Jew. She was a proud Zionist and a proud advocate for the Jewish people, and she backed down in front of no one. There were many contributions that my mother made, but there are two contributions that I think stand out above all, and those are the two I want to speak about today. One, 
already in the late 1960s, remember she herself is a Holocaust survivor who made her way to Israel. I actually thought she was Israeli until around the, until my bar mitzvah. I did not really know the whole story of the Holocaust with her until later. As she began to study and to learn and become more of a scholar, she was taken aback by the fact that any, everything that had to do with the Holocaust were documents predominantly produced by the Third Reich, by the Nazis. And that scholarship of the Holocaust inevitably meant going through German documents in the period of 1933 to 1945. And that's what the Holocaust was about. The Holocaust was about going through their documents, their numbers, their story of what they did. And she felt this was wrong and historically incorrect. She said the real way to re another avenue to understand what happened in the Holocaust, both as a scholar, as a Jew, and as a human being, is to start hearing the stories of the Holocaust survivors themselves. For a variety of reasons. Number one, they're eyewitnesses. Number two, they will give a human dimension to this horrific tragedy, to this horrific genocide, excuse me. It's not a tragedy, it was a premeditated murder. And secondly, we will, or thirdly, we will garner a lot of information from these people. And lastly, she already saw in the late 1960s that the day will not be far off in the future where people will deny that this happened. And therefore, we need to have these eyewitnesses. And she was the first one to come up with the idea that survivors need to be interviewed. Now, there was no protocol to how to do it. My mother came up with a protocol. The fact is that if you begin to interview a person, remember this is the late 1960s, a person who, for whatever reason, chose not to talk about the Holocaust to their spouse, to their children, to their family, you begin to get into the subject too quickly, and not really in an empathetic way, you can cause that person to literally have heart failure. You can cause them to, to go into shock. You can cause them to start reliving things they've tried to suppress. So my mother came up with this protocol of slowly but surely kind of understanding, befriending the survivor, and then slowly but surely getting into a discussion, or actually them telling a story. And when she began doing this at Brooklyn College, her first interviewers were her students in her courses at Brooklyn College on the Holocaust. And the first survivors were their parents. So in many cases, and this I found out when we were sitting Shiva, what these students or interviewers found out were things like their parents had been married before and lost an entire family in the Holocaust, or that they had siblings who were killed in the Holocaust, or why certain names were not given to their family, to their siblings, because that was the name of someone who perished in a concentration camp. That's where it began. And between the 60s, first it was real to real, then it was cassettes, then it was those humongous VHS recorders, then eventually the smaller ones. And between the late 60s and around 1993, my mother and her students, and then later in the Holocaust Center, had interviewed 5,000 survivors. Most of those interviews are here. Now, the interesting thing is when my mother began to do this, people in the scholarly world scoffed at my mother. This is not scholarship. This is entertainment. This is the equivalent of you know, running some sort of a special program of nostalgia. And all the people who supposedly were the big scholars in the area of Holocaust studies thought it was silly, made fun of it, thought it wasn't relevant. It's 2019, and we all know who was correct and who was not correct. This is something incalculable in terms of the, of the information that we had and the message that it sent. Now, what people don't know is that what my mother did that influenced a man who most people are familiar with when it comes to interviewing survivors, which is Steven Spielberg. When he went and made <coughs> Schindler's List, he really had no idea how popular it would be and that it would be a box office hit. He did it more or less, it was a labor of love. Turns out, for those of us who remember, the movie came out in 93, 
or 94, I don't remember. I think I won seven Oscars at the time, and the feedback was just remarkable. He literally made the Holocaust understandable, if you could use that term, to a whole new generation or two generations. And that's when he realized, I need to start interviewing survivors as well. <clears throat> Who did he contact? My mother. And my mother and her research gave him the protocol, and then in the next decade, thanks to his resources and his contacts and the world he comes from, 50,000 more survivors have been interviewed. So my mother is the one who changed the concept of how you gather information about the Holocaust. It's not merely documentation, it is interviewing. And he interviewed the survivors. As we know, at every passing year, there are less and less survivors to interview. And thank God, there are 55,000 on tape and audio, thanks to my mother. That's her first big contribution, one of many. The second one is also, I think, altering when it comes to the whole concept of the Holocaust. And that is, it bothered my mother already again, late 1960s, early 1970s. Anything that had to do with the Holocaust, including Yad Vashem, all pictures were the pictures that the Nazis took, <coughs> excuse me, or the liberators took. And basically, the Jews appear in all these pictures the way the Nazis wanted to depict the Jews, subhuman, untermenschen. For better or for worse, that's what we look like. S skin and bones, half crazed, whether you were coming out of a ghetto or living under a pig's fire like my mother, or coming out of a cave, or predominantly those who were rescued from concentration camps, you didn't look normal. You didn't look human. That's exactly the way the Nazis wanted us to look. And my mother said this is unacceptable, that even when we commemorate the Holocaust, what we're ending up doing is kind of doing it the way the Nazis would like us to do it. Show the Jews as the Untermenschen. And my mother said that's unacceptable. And what she wanted to do is to begin to show what was it like the day before the Nazis came. And what she did was, she used her own town as a microcosm of what life was like in Europe before the Holocaust. Her town was Eschershoff, which she made famous. And she tracked down every person that owned a camera in Eschershoff that took pictures from the first time cameras showed up in Eschershoff. Her grandmother was a photographer, and then she literally did, you know, detective work to find out who had cameras, when did they emigrate from Meshishaw to other parts of Europe, to North America, to South America, South Africa, Australia, you name it. And she tracked them down, and over a 17-year period, at her own expense, she traveled around the world, I think to every continent except Antarctica, and she collected pictures from Meshishaw. She knocked on doors like a full of brush salesman. People slammed the door in her face. Eventually, she got her way in, and she would go in people's attics and find pictures that nobody wanted to look at. By the time she was done, she had collected 5,000 pictures of what life was like in one town in Meshishaw from the late 1880s till a few days before the Nazis shot everybody in 1941 in Einsatzgruppen in Eschershoff. And she went through those 5,000 and she collected the best 1,400. And that became the famous exhibit in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. It's a 30-foot tower of life. Some people call it the Tower of Faces. And the sign that used to be there that I've been in and out, sometimes the sign is there, sometimes the sign is not there. But the purpose was, the sign is, this is what people looked like in a shtetl or in a Jewish town before the Nazis came. And 5,000 of these towns were destroyed. And it suddenly puts a name and a face and a lifestyle. It's not a untermensch, it's a normal person. And if you've been there, you see them, Jews living a life. Whether it's playing ball, whether it's rowing boats at a little lake, or whether it's learning in the yeshiva, or getting married, or having fun, or being part of the volunteer fire department, or those who served in the Polish army, or those who are involved in different Zionist youth movements, you name it, it showed life. 
And I've been in a museum many times, and I've watched just people who go by. The overwhelming majority of people who go through are not Jewish. Over 20 million people have gone through the museum, and that was at three years ago. And when they, when they fill out questionnaires, which of the exhibits made the greatest impact on them, they all say, or the, not all, the vast majority talk about the Tower of Life. Because it's a very personal human reaction. You look at it and you say, there for the grace of God go I. And suddenly you realize who it was the Nazis killed. People like you, except they were Jews. People who had a normal life that suddenly vanished. And since then, Many museums have popped up. Yad Vashem has changed their whole exhibit. When you walk in, you have that rotunda full of faces. Hundreds and hundreds of books have been published about different towns and shtetlach that talk about what life was like with pictures before the Nazis came. And it suddenly changed the whole calculus of what we think of, of what exactly the Nazis destroyed. They didn't destroy broken subhuman people they destroyed or attempted to destroy a normal, flourishing people. The last thing I'll say is this, and this goes back to my mother's first big innovation, which is interviewing. There was another group of people, my mother realized she has to interview, and unlike the survivors, the clock is ticking even faster on that group, the liberators. Your typical soldier that made it, whether it's a Brit, an American or a Russian was like 20. The lieutenants, 23, 24. Captains, late 20s, 30s. A battalion commander could be close to 40. If it was a brigade commander, 50. She went out in the 70s and 80s and interviewed, she spoke many languages, including Russian, and she interviewed hundreds of Brits, Americans, and Russians. The overwhelming majority of them have passed away. And they gave her her eyewitness account of what they saw at a Dachau, at a Bergen-Belsen, at an Auschwitz. Those are the three camps liberated. I purposely did that. The Brits did Bergen-Belsen, the Americans did Dachau, and the Russians did Auschwitz. And that now is also on record as to what people saw at the time. So in conclusion, I'd say the following. My mother changed the way we look at the Shoah, completely and totally. And the scholars who scoffed at her, I guess those who didn't apologize should have, and everybody else who are scholars today know that's the way to study the Holocaust. It's not just the documents. These interviews have become an, a necessity in every Holocaust studies department in the free world, not to mention in Yad Vashem and here and in, and, and in Washington, D.C. And so thank you for coming today, and hopefully her work and what she's been has done will continue to be relevant for generations to come. The last person who's speaking from our family is the most important person from our family, and that's my father. My father, Rabbi Dr. David Eliach, now is not the time to go into it, is an innovator in Jewish education. He's a person, if, I, if my math is right, it's his 77th year in Jewish education, still being active. He's considered the dean of Jewish education in North America. He's won an award from the President of Israel, this was 20 years ago, in 1997, uh, uh, when Weitzman was the President, Ezer, not the first Weitzman. It's a special uh, um, a prize that you win for the educator of the diaspora. He still works in Jewish education, mentoring <laughs> teachers. A book of his poetry in Hebrew will be published in about two months in Israel. And he's still writing biblical scholarship and, and uh, explanations. I just want to walk down and bring him up. My father, Rabbi Dr. David Elliott.
אני לא ראיתי אותך ליד הקבר בשעת הלוויה. אני לא ראיתי את החיוך על פנייך. לא ראיתי את מלאכי אלוקים יורדים איתך אל מעמקי האדמה. לא ראיתי את עשרות המלווים, ידידים וחברים של יפה עליה השלום, ולא שמעתי את הקדיש מהדהד בהרי ירושלים, יתקדר ויתקדש מי רבה. לא ראיתי הדמעות הזולגות בתוך הלבבות, ולא ראיתי את ענן השכינה מעל היפה. מאיר באור עולם של תקווה וגאולה. לא ראיתי את היאים מכסים באפר את אי שופרא דבלה בהרה, אבל ראיתי אישה בעלת חזון מחבקת את עפר קברו של החופץ חיים ודומעת דמעת קודש ורדין, קבר שנעקר מעל האדמה ונזרק אל האשפה. ראיתי אישה נלחמת עם גדולי חכמי ההיסטוריה היהודית על הצורך לראיין את הניצולים, את הסוביירס, ואין לכתוב היסטוריה יהודית בלי יהודים, שאין לכתוב היסטוריה של שואה רק על פסי רכבת, קרונות ומספרים יבשים על מיליוני אנשים. ראיתי אישה שבחלה ברצח הרוצחים ולא סבלה את המילה נקמה וחזונה היה כבוד האדם. ראיתי אישה חזקה, אמיצה, תקיפה, לבצע את חלומה, להקים שטקל ולהראות מי היו היהודים האלה. ראיתי אותך במאבקייך, באמונתך, באהבת עם ישראל ומדינת ישראל. חכמה היית, ורצית להקים יד ושם למיליונים של יין קלח ושלוים הלך, ורבנים ומשכילים וגאוני תורה, בעלי פרס נובל, גומלי חסד, שנעלמו. וסתם יהודים טובים שעלו על המוקד. <coughs> הרבה מחלומותייך, הרבה מחזונך, יעמדו לנצח נצחים. תהא נשמתך צרורה בצרור החיים. אבקש לקום לכל מלא רחמים. אל מלא רחמים שוכן במרומים, אמצי מנוחה נכונה תחת כנפי השכינה, במעלות קדושים או טהורים, כזוהר הרקיע מזהירים את נשמת יפה בת משה אליהו, שהלכה לעולמה. ברור שהמשפחה תיתן צדקה על השכרת נשמתם, וגן עדן תהיה מנוחתם. לכן בעל הרחמים יסתירה בסט הכנפיו. לעולמים, ויצרור יצרור החיים את נשמתה, השם הוא נחלתה, ותנוע בשלום המשכבה, ונאמר אמן. בבקשה לשבת, שאתה יהיו ההרצאה.
I'd like to thank the Eliach family members for bringing Dr. Yaffa Eliach to life for us and for helping us remember her many outstanding contributions. Thank you. It is my honor to introduce our next speaker, distinguished scholar, Professor Bora Dwork, who will now present the third annual Dr. Yaffa Eliaf Memorial Lecture, The World of Auschwitz. Professor Dwork is the visionary founding director of the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University, author of numerous award-winning books, including Auschwitz 1270 to the Present, co-authored with Robert Jan von Pelt, Professor Dwork has been inter alia a Guggenheim Fellow, a Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and a Fellow of the American Council of Learned Societies. She serves on many advisory boards and works with numerous nonprofit organizations and foundations concerned with Holocaust education. Professor Dwork is a longtime friend to this museum, and it is my pleasure to welcome her to speak with you today. The mic is on? Yes. I am honored to deliver the third annual Yafa Eliyah Memorial Lecture, and I am moved to just tell you this one small story which I mentioned to you before. I published my first book on the history of the Holocaust. It was called Children with a Star just when the first international gathering of child survivors was held here in New York. And Professor Aliyah was the keynote speaker, or a keynote speaker, I really don't remember anymore because I only remember her. Anyway, I was this very junior assistant professor at the time. And Professor Eliyah took the time and the effort to come to say to me, you wrote the right book at the right time, and you gave voice to our generation. It was an enormously generous thing to have done, and it served as a source of strength. So as you can imagine, I am really honored to give this lecture today. So first, let me go through the frame. The aim of my talk is to go beyond the exhibition tagline that you see outside the Aus for the Auschwitz exhibition, not long ago, not far away, to which I would add, and not predestined to become an infamous killing center. As you will hear, the Germans established a concentration camp right next to the town of Auschwitz in German, Oświęcim in Polish, for very specific reasons. Point number one in this lecture will be what were their aims? What fueled their actions? And next, step by step, the camp accrued functions. It grew into a murder site. That is the creation of the world of Auschwitz. And the Jewish victims of that world, you will hear from them too. Dutch, Slovak, Hungarian, Polish, all Jews, all deported to Auschwitz. You have, I hope everyone has a list of terms. Do you? Hello? Anyone need them when Liz has extras? So the first thing to tell you the good news is there will not be any exam at the end. Um, the 
point of the terms is that if you are like I am and you hear something that doesn't sit easily in your ear, you will turn to the person next to you and say, what did she say? So this way you have the names as we go along. Some of them are, of course, historically important people. Some of them are unknown, like the very first person we'll be talking about, Frida Bromet. Um, but anyway, that is the point of this list. It is not in alphabetical order. It is in chronological order as I am speaking. So the other good news is that when you think, when is this woman ever going to stop talking? <laughs> Look at the list, see where you are. <laughs> I will speak for 42 minutes, plus minus 10%, depending upon how often I breathe. <laughs> I was very ill with pleurisy and typhus, Frida Bromet, remembering. She was 19 years old, Dutch, Jewish, and a prisoner in Auschwitz Birkenau. And then January came, January 18, 1945, and we heard shooting in the distance. The Germans came to our barrack and they said, everyone march. If you don't get up, you will be shot. So we had to go. I had no clothes. My mother fetched some rent. She took me under her arm, dressed in those rags, and I fainted. I hadn't been on my feet in months, and people were walking over me. While the rest of the inmates marched on, Frida's mother dragged her back. We couldn't move. We stayed. And we were not shot. Frida, her mother, and other inmates too ill to move were about to be liberated by the Soviet army. We had no bread anymore. We were in no man's land for 10 days, and my mother fed me with snow. Then the Russians came. As the soldiers approached that Saturday, 27 January 1945, they found 5,800 inmates of whom Frida and her mother were two in an enormous compound in Birkenau, just west of the town. The SS, as Frida said, had forced the rest of the camp, some 60,000 people at that point, to march west in the middle of the winter, dressed, as was she, in rags. The crushing number of murders, the overwhelming scale of the crime, isolates Auschwitz from us. And my aim today is to challenge that isolation, to reestablish Auschwitz as just another place which became what it did by ordinary people using ordinary procedures, requisition forms, planning permissions, bills of sale, bills of receipt. Tragically, these ordinary people had extraordinary ambitions to recover the chimera they called Germany's lost past and to re recreate the equally illusionary, racially pure nation. Most histories of Auschwitz begin in 1940, but the men who established the concentration camp, like many Germans in the 1920s and the 1930s, <laughs> saw Auschwitz as a town in what they called the German East. Just as 19th century European Americans sought to fulfill their manifest destiny in the West, and Edwardian England was busy coloring the globe pink, the Germans turned to the east. The town and the region, the town of Ozienschen, Auschwitz, had been German before. It should be German again. The German east 
is our nostalgia and our fulfillment, the minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, explained. And for once, he spoke the truth. By the 1920s and 1930s, the American frontier had become the stuff of Hollywood movies. For contemporary Germans, however, the promise of the German East, their entitlement to it for Lebensraum, or living space, the mission of forging a folk, a nation of Germanic peoples, and the ideology of racial purity loomed large. These ideas shaped political rhetoric and military considerations. We may not take Lebensraum or the folk seriously, but Adolf Hitler, Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler, the Commandant of Auschwitz Rudolf Hess, millions of Germans, they took it seriously. Those objectives informed their thinking and prompted their actions. Indeed, a vision of the town's German past and utopian dreams about its German future triggered Himmler's initial interest in Auschwitz and influenced the first two years of the development of the concentration camp. He saw Auschwitz as the centerpiece of a huge Germanization comprehensive program. It was perfectly situated for that function. Good soil, lots of water, and good train connections. The huge chemical conglomerate IG Farben thought it was well situated too. Hitler had decided to wean Germany from dependence on imported products, and the task of creating synthetic rubber, or BUNA, fell to IG Farben. Dr. Otto Ambrose, did you find him on your list? You there? So Dr. Otto Ambrose, chairman of the Committee for Rubber and Plastics at IG Farben, <coughs> needed to find the perfect place for a new factory requiring huge quantities of water, a flat stretch of land, and good railroad connections. As he studied the map, he paid particular attention to the meeting point of three rivers. Geologically, the site seemed ideal. Furthermore, three railroad lines converged to the west on a settlement which the map produced a few years earlier identified <laughs> in Polish as the town of Oświęcim. So Ambrose became interested in Auschwitz without ever having heard of it before. He was an engineer in search of synthetic fuel and rubber, not a Nazi ideologue dreaming about the German past. So by a completely different, independent path, Ambrose, like Himmler, came to focus his attention on Auschwitz simply because it was important to the future of IG Farben. As Ambrose found out, the SS had got there before him. After the invasion and occupation of Poland in September 1939, Himmler incorporated large parts of Poland, including the area where Auschwitz is located, into the Reich. It was Himmler's job to Germanize these annexed territories by deporting local Slavs and Jews and moving in ethnic Germans. But that formula didn't work in Auschwitz. Some of the local pop Polish population, some of the local populate, Polish population was indeed deported, but some could not be because they were industrial workers and there were no skilled German workers to take their place. So Himmler's response was to transform a former Polish military base in the suburb of the town to transform that military base 
into a concentration camp to terrorize the local Polish population. This was spring 1940. He reckoned that having the camp there would keep that Polish population in check, and it did. He appointed SS Captain Rudolf Hoess as its first commandant and sent him off to Auschwitz to build the camp. This was the first function of the camp, to incarcerate unruly Poles, not Jews. It was to have many more, step by step, function by function, Auschwitz grew. One of its most important functions was to serve as a kind of what we here in America call an agricultural experiment station. And that was to facilitate Himmler's ethnic force removal program. Moving out the local Polish agricultural population, moving in newly arrived ethnic Germans. And they needed to learn about soil conditions, crops, animal husbandry. So Himmler envisioned a vast agricultural estate on grounds adjacent to the camp to support them in their endeavors. This was yet another function of Auschwitz, to support the Germanization of that area. So as far as Himmler was concerned, the situation was moving along very nicely. And when I.G. Farben decided to invest hundreds of millions of marks to build a state-of-the-art synthetic rubber plant at the edge of Auschwitz, Himmler realized that the concentration camp could become the center of a huge SS-controlled project. The company's decision, in other words, presented Himmler with what he saw as a terrific opportunity. The slave labor of the prisoners could be used to construct the plant and to enlarge the town of Auschwitz, making it attractive to the well-paid and highly educated IG Farben engineers and managers. Himmler was determined to transform Auschwitz, the town, and its environs. He was determined to transform, the, transform them into the utopia of his dreams and make money to boot. The first part of the project, the Buna plant, was built, and thousands of inmates worked there as slaves. To lease prisoners to I.G. Farben was only a small part of Himmler's grand scheme, however. More important to him was to use those workers to aggrandize the town. To that end, he established a large camp designed for 125,000 inmates at Birkenau three kilometers distant from Auschwitz. He intended to fill it with Soviet prisoners of war, but Göring redirected them to the armament industries in the winter of 1941. When Himmler received formal authority over the now final solution to the Jewish problem at the Wannsee Conference in January 1942, he turned to the Jews. The only question was, which Jews to send to Birkenau? The Jews of Hitler's client state of Slovakia met Himmler's needs. And in January 1942, Slovakia offered the German labor, labor ministry 20,000 strong young Jews for work in Germany. The order came four weeks prior to the end of March. Helen Spitzer, one of the targeted 20,000 Jews were called. End of February. They printed large placards and pasted them onto the kiosks. No written invitation. They announced that Jewish girls, unmarried, 
I think it was 15 or 16 through 45 or 50, were ordered to assemble on a certain date. It was the 31st of March, I remember, on a Monday. The order said that if you didn't report, your parents will be taken instead. So it was a little bit of a tricky business. No one wanted to sacrifice the parents. If I would have run, I would have, say, undertaken to escape to one of the neighboring countries, my parents would have been taken instead. Now, I had another possibility. My employer, who was a German, decided to ask for an exemption because there was a shortage of manpower in my profession, which he did. It was that bloody Monday that was the turning point in my life. I had to leave for the collection point early in the morning, before office time. So I could not go to my employer and collect the permission. It was promised. It was signed. It was ready. But I still had to leave, because if I wouldn't have reported, they would have picked up my parents. It was a very tricky business. It was bad luck, one day difference, and I could have stayed. <clears throat> the Slovaks soon realized that with 20,000 young Jews deported, many families had lost their breadwinner and would become a burden on the Slovak economy. They begged the Germans to take all their Jews. The Germans, however, were interested only in acquiring able-bodied slaves. And the resolution of these conflicting interests was all too simple. All the Slovak Jews would be sent to Birkenau, where they would be subjected to a selection process. Those fit for work would live. The unfit were to be killed. To prepare, on Thursday, February 27, 1942, the Commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess, the Chief of SS Construction, Hans Kammler, and the Chief Architect of the Camp, Karl Bischoff, decided that a large crematorium that had been designated for the main camp several months earlier would now go to the subcamp of Birkenau. Auschwitz was a brutal place and the camp officials had ordered this crematorium to dispose of the bodies of the inmates who died or were killed because of that brutality, not because they foresaw that Auschwitz would become a site of genocide. When the situation with the Slovak Jews arose, however, they had those incinerators on order the camp officials took the next step and reallocated their resources. The machinery had already been ordered, and it would now be used to dispose of the bodies of the Jews they found unfit for work. Rather than to dispose of the bodies of men in the main camp who had died from disease, hunger, or abuse. On July 4, a first transport of 1,000 Slovak Jews was submitted to selection upon arrival at Auschwitz. The Germans lined them up and chose 264 able-bodied men and 108 able-bodied women. The remaining 638 people were killed. On that July 4, selection and killing became an integral part in the world of Auschwitz. But it was not yet its primary purpose. Himmler still saw Jews as a means to realize his dream to create, in cooperation with I.G. Farben, a new German Eden in the town of Auschwitz. And he had to abandon that dream for Auschwitz to become the premier killing center. 
And that is precisely what happened. Two weeks later, so now we're in mid-July, Himmler breezed into the office of his confidant, the massage therapist Felix Kirsten. This is the happiest day of my life. Everything I have been considering and planning on a small scale can now be realized on a grand scale. Hitler was euphoric because Hitler had all but told him that he would be authorized to begin the German settlement of Russia. It was the happiest day of his life, he repeated. It is the greatest piece of colonization the world will ever see, he enthused. Jubilant, he embarked upon a week-long trip of the German, to, the, to the German East to initiate some new projects and tie up loose ends at Auschwitz. Much had changed since March 1941 when Auschwitz had offered him a unique opportunity to realize his dreams. By July 1942, that magic had vanished. Bigger and better things were coming his way. The war with Russia had made him drunk with Lebensraum. Compared to the Germanization of Russia, the Auschwitz project appeared very paltry. Himmler and his entourage arrived in Birkenau that July 1942, and now Huss's post-war testimony. He saw the emaciated victims of epidemics, the overcrowded barracks, the primitive and totally inadequate toilet and wash facilities. He was told about the high rate of illness and the death rate by the doctors and their causes. He was explained everything in the greatest detail. He saw everything in stark reality, yet he said absolutely nothing. The company proceeded to the railway spur adjacent to the main line, where he watched the selection of a transport from Holland. Himmler very carefully observed the whole process of annihilation. He began with the unloading at the ramp and completed the inspection as the gas chamber was being cleared of the bodies. He did not complain about anything. The next morning, Himmler subjected the camp to another round of inspections. According to Huss, it was then that he confirmed the new role of Auschwitz as a destination for Europe's Jews. The, the deportation program will continue, he announced, and will be accelerated every month from now on. See to it that you move ahead with the completion of Birkenau. The gypsies are to be exterminated. With the same relentlessness, you will exterminate those Jews who are unable to work. As the construction of the town was on hold until after the war, Jews fit for labor would be dispatched to other camps to work in the armament industries. Now, Auschwitz-Birkenau would be a selection site, a killing field for those who could not work, and a holding pen for those who could. And Himmler left, relieved. His ambitions now were elsewhere. And Auschwitz had been reduced from his favorite project to the garbage heap of his empire. But Himmler's hope to Germanize Russia, those hopes were dashed in January 1943. As the German army faced defeat in Stalingrad, his dream to oversee the settlement of millions of Germans evaporated. Of all of his ambitions, only one could now be realized to enact a truly final solution to the Jewish question. In January 1943, Himmler had no illusion that Germany could win the war, but at least he could dispose of the Jews. 
That was one deed he could accomplish. And the Germans had learned that killing by gas was easy. Disposing of the bodies was the rate limiting step. So Chief of Construction Kammler and Camp Architect Carl Bischoff pressed on to complete the crematoria. The camp now had an official incineration capacity of some 4,750 corpses every day. And according to the inmate Rudy Verba, Himmler came to see what he had wrought. All four crematoria and beer canal had been completed. The gas chambers had been well packed with Polish Jews in advance, but somehow breakfast lasted until 11. Finally, Himmler and Huss <coughs> turned to business. They drove to the crematorium, this is all from Wurba, got out and chatted for a while to the senior officer present. Himmler ambled over to the sealed door, glanced casually through the small, thick observation window at the squirming bodies inside, then returned to fire some more questions at his underlings. Finally, he gave permission for the, to commence operation. As the children, women, and men were dying inside, Himmler peeped once again through the window, asked some more questions, smoked a cigarette, laughed, joked, and observed the subsequent procedures with great interest. Himmler waited until the smoke began to thicken over the chimneys, and then he glanced at his watch. It was one o'clock, lunchtime, in fact. The four new crematoria came into operation after the Holocaust itself had peaked. The Judeocide had begun in 1941, and the Germans killed some 1.1 million Jews that year. In 1942, they murdered another 2.7 million, of whom about 200,000 died in Auschwitz. The year the crematoria of Auschwitz came into operation, the number of victims dropped to half a million, half of whom were killed in Auschwitz. All the Jews that the Germans could track easily had already been killed. The Hungarian Jews were the sole remaining major Jewish community in Europe, and the Germans occupied Hungary in March 1944. The labor shortage had become so acute that in April, Himmler, Hitler instructed Himmler to obtain 100,000 Jewish slave laborers from Hungary immediately. Auschwitz thus acquired its last function. It was to become a gigantic labor exchange. Hungary's Jews were to be shipped in. Slave workers would be selected and shipped out again to a network of concentration camps in the Reich that served Germany's industrial needs. Those selected for work in Germany were to be kept until transport to the West was available. Jews unfit for work were to be gassed and burned. And let me tell you that in the spring of 1944, the Germans expected that most of the arrivals would be found unfit for work. So the crematoria were overhauled. New grates were fitted in the generators. The chimneys underwent a thorough inspection and repair, as did the electric fans. The walls, the four changing rooms, and the eight gas chambers were given a fresh coat of paint. The train lines were extended right into the camp. Day and night, many hundreds of prisoners were busy laying train railway tracks right to the crematoria. 
The first transport of Hungarian Jews arrived in Auschwitz on April 29 and pulled over the new spur line through the gates into Birkenau. A few weeks later, Himmler boasted that at the moment, we are indeed bringing 100,000 and later another 100,000 male Jews from Hungary to concentration camps to build underground, underground factories. By the end of June, in just two months, half of Hungary's jewelry, over 380,000 people, had arrived in Auschwitz. One of them was the 18-year-old Alexander Ehrman, who, until spring of 1944, had lived in the town of Kirali Hamish. His transport pulled into Birkenau at night. We arrived around 1 o'clock in the morning in an area with lights, floodlights, and stench. We saw flames, tall chimneys. We still didn't want to accept that it was Auschwitz. We preferred to think that we didn't know than to acknowledge, yes, we are there. The train stopped. Outside, we heard all kinds of noises, stench, language, commands we didn't understand. It was in German, but we didn't know what it meant. Dogs barked. The doors flung open, and we saw strange uniformed men in striped clothes. They started to yell at us in the Yiddish of Polish Jews, Schnell, the house. We started to ask them, where are we? They answered, Raus, Raus, Raus. Sentries and their dogs were there, and they yelled at us also, Macht Schnell. We got out, and they told us to get in formations of five and to leave all the luggage there. We asked one of the guys, tell me, tell me, where are we going? Dog gate, he said, and he pointed towards the flames. We had to go on. So we formed up, true to family tradition, two parents, the oldest sister and the next sister, and the child on my sister's hand. My mother asked her, let me carry him, two and a half years old. She said, no, I'll take care of my own son. So the three sisters and my two parents were walking and the two boys in the next two rows with three other people. We came up to Mangala. We were standing there. He was pointing left, right. My sister was the first one with a child, and he pointed to the right. Then my mother, who had a rupture, she had a big belly. She looked like she was pregnant, but she wasn't. So I guess that made her go to the side. My father and the two sisters pointed to the left. He asked my father, old man, what work do you do? And my father said, farm work. And then came the next row. And, two of us, and the two of us, that is Alex and his brother, were also told to go after our father and two sisters. But he stopped, and he called my father back. Put out your hand. So my father showed him his hand, and Mangala smacked him across the face and pushed him to the other side. And he continued, schnell. And the sentries were there, and the dogs, and we have to move. And that's the last we saw of our parents and sister and nephew. Daylight broke, and we moved on to an area where there was barbed wire on both sides. We walked down an alley, a sentry so often spaced out. We kept on moving. We were prodded to move faster. We were told, you'll be coming to an area where you will be given a bath and change of clothes, and you'll be told what to do. We were walking, and beyond the barbed wire fences, there were piles of rubble and branches, pine tree branches and rubble burning, slowly burning. We're walking by, and the sentries kept on screaming, lauf, lauf. 
and I heard a baby crying. The baby was crying somewhere in the distance, and I couldn't stop to look. We moved and it smelled a horrible stench. I knew that things in the fire were moving. There were babies in the fire. Of the total 438,000 incoming Jews, between 10 and 30% were found fit to make their contribution to the German war effort. Alex and his 16-year-old brother were sent to Warsaw, where they were put to work in the ruins of the erstwhile ghetto, tearing down the walls and salvaging the bricks. The frenetic gassing and burning continued through July. In two months, one third of the total number of people murdered at Auschwitz were killed. Research about the utopian visions of the perpetrators, their obsessions with the German East and the German folk, Himmler's plans to Germanize the town of Auschwitz, and the step-by-step, function-by-function development of the camp tells us much that is important. But this is not the whole story. It is the questions of the victims and the survivors which sit at the heart of Auschwitz. When Sarah Grossman Weil faced selection upon arrival at Auschwitz, this is also the summer of 44, I lost sight of what was going on. It's crazy. I was standing with my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law with her little girl when someone approached us and said, give this child to the grandmother. And my sister-in-law gave the child to my mother-in-law. They went to the left, and we went to the right. And I said, why? My mother-in-law took the little one and went to the left. Regina, Esther, and I went to the right. To the left were all the people who were led to the gas chambers, crematorium, however you call it. Gas chambers, crematorium, however you call it. Half a century later, Sura was not precise. What mattered was that the men were separated from the women and that the grandmother, Fegele, and the little girl, Mirka, went to the left. And the adolescent, Regina, and the two sisters-in-law, Esther and Sarah, went to the right. And she is correct. That process of selection is the core and moral nadir of the horror of the Holocaust. The selection and not the gas chambers and the crematoria. Because once the Germans and their allies had arrogated to themselves the power to decide who would live and who would die, the technology was easy. The Rubicon in their descent to evil was to assume the right to determine who should and who would not inhabit the world. Mirka, Sarah, and hundreds of thousands of other deportees lined up for selection by a physician. Had he worked alone, he could have done little harm, but he did not. His work was but a small part of a system envisioned by ideologues, organized by bureaucrats, financed by industrialists, serviced by technocrats, operated by ordinary men, and supported by millions of Germans whose daily lives were improved by the goods shipped home to the Reich for their use. And Sarah's question remains. And I said, why?
fantastic work. This was a comprehensive uh, outline of how we got to where we got. Um, I learned a lot, and it was with uh, the testimonies that moved us so much. Thank you very, very much. Um, this concludes our program. Um, we uh, thank you again to the family of Dr. Yafa Elia. I invite all of those of you who wish to stop in the lobby and light a memorial candle in commemoration of Kristallnacht. Thank you.